factory based systems and stuff like that. Um, but you have some significant changes in society that take place um, because of this. The first thing has to do with the um, economy and just general uh, over uh, the wealth. While for the laborers the conditions were bad and um, they, didn't, they didn't get much better, overall if you look on average Right, there were two things that happened. Um, one, uh, people had more wealth. Again, this doesn't preclude um, that different specific groups, that's not necessarily the case. Also, goods were cheaper. One of the consequences of the factory systems was that they were mass producing goods, which meant that prices went down. So when you have overall an average in society that more people have wealth um, and, and goods are cheaper, they can buy more things, right? That's what this leads to. You can buy more stuff. This in tandem with the rise of what was the new middle class. There was not an official middle class before. There was the middling group. The industrial early market revolution and industrial period created a middle class, a very distinct middle class, which was a large uh, group of the population. I mean, the poor were still uh, significant, but this, this was a, a very distinct larger group than compared to the wealthy. And that they, um, these were managers, um, bankers, lawyers, etc., um, foremen of the factories, and they had enough money now to um, try to uh, to copy the rich, right? They wanted to be able to purchase goods for the house um, and, and copy the rich. However, they could not afford imports. Like uh, the really wealthy, um, we'll say the imports or what wealthy people actually purchased. The wealthy would like have um, dresses shipped from Paris for the latest fashion, right? They'd have very expensive grand pianos and things like that. Um, and so this created uh, uh, a new type of economic, we'll put economic consumption. And this was coupled with um, women in the middle class uh, staying home. Right, that was a sign of, of your wealth that the wife didn't have to work. Instead, she could stay home and raise the children. And so because you now had this larger middle class with an, a larger economic consumption and women staying home, they became um, the spenders and managers of the uh, household wealth, right? Well, the husband, this, is, well, this will be also important for the cult of domesticity because the husband leaves the house, right? And so you have a whole new system of um, shopping um, that takes place and, and actual um, stores where you have department stores for the first time and mail, um, uh, books, catalogs um, that you could um, mail order uh, catalogs for, for buying stuff and women would go and purchase stuff and the point of the department stores and the mail order ca catalogs was to provide the cheaper uh, version of uh, what wealthy people bought. See, the thing is, is that in a lot of uh, period of society, besides the uh, ultra wealthy, um, people didn't buy things because they wanted them. They didn't have enough surplus money to do so. You bought the things you needed. And so this is actually going to also um, create 
uh, uh, influx and we'll put it here new advertisements okay so people in the past they bought what they needed they didn't buy extra stuff for the house the house we we have an abundance of stuff in our house these days and um, in the past people had just like a kind of the, the basic necessities so advertisement was very straightforward uh, we have this table and it's this length and then there's this and this there was no attempt to like have the psychological component to sell you on it because ultimately you either needed it or you didn't but now because women were staying home and they were the ones that were had purchasing power because they, they were part of that middle class that now had enough money uh, uh, extra surplus money to do so um, department stores were created in mail order catalogs and and there you, uh, they shifted began to shift advertisement to try to entice women to purchase things for their house and and they did women went and purchased additional things to add to their household because they could and they were trying to emulate the wealthy um, and so that they it, it, we'll, we'll look at how advertising changes there's there's three kind of main stages that it does this is the first and in, instead they did try to uh, uh, sometimes target a want over a need the a good example of that was um, ivory soap and they uh, they were working on a new formula and it, and it didn't work but instead what they accidentally created was soap that floated so remember laundry at this point is a big tub with the washboard and it's super tedious uh, uh, everyone I don't think there is there's any document that ever describes a woman liking doing the laundry because it was a long all-day process it was tedious it scalded your hands and um, you know this normal soap sunk to the bottom so you you keep it in the wash tub and then you'd pull it out and use it and scrub the clothes and then it would drop back into the wash tub the soap that they, when they were trying to change the formula that what it did is it the ivory soap floated on the water and so they they created an advertisement that says it floats and and talked about how much ease it was and they charged more for it even though it didn't cost them any more to make than the regular ivory soap so there was something you didn't need the soap that floated it was a convenience and you were willing to pay more because people had money for it to do so it was a want it was a desire that's that beginning shift in advertisement now it's going to get advertising is going to get far more uh, complex during world war one um but you and then in the 1920s as as well but um this was that beginning beginning the early rumblings of that transition to that um, and so you created this whole culture on purchasing power and, and economics um, because women were expected to be the ones while their husbands were out working in the middle class to go out and buy. And they bought because they were, they had money to do so, goods were cheaper, and they were trying to replicate in a cheaper fashion what the wealthy did. Uh, we have, so here is a, a, an, a Sears and Roebuck and Co. Uh, cover to their mail order catalog um, and these books i have a replica like just a smaller one um that that is it was the, they were a bigger size like a magazine the one i have is is smaller it's just a replica of it but it, it is insane what they have in it. it it has everything anything you could possibly think of um this catalog had so the the idea that the department store is kind of like the early mall but instead in uh, or maybe the early walmart right instead of instead of in the all over stores it's in one store so may, the early mall or maybe an early walmart kind of thing where anything you could want and, and literally anything so it, it had um uh furniture it had musical instruments um it had uh guns it had um, tonics, as it was called, which were like, they had hair tonics for hair loss. They had these pills for women's um, female problems, is what they called it. Um, it had um, clothes. This doesn't want to write right there. All right, well it doesn't want to let me write right there so let's try it over here there we go <laughs> apparently that was too close to the edge i'm um, gonna have clothes it had any, anything you could think of it uh, i'm trying to think of like what else off the top of my head um but it, they actually sold coffins so it's random like all oh, these nice of coffins 
Um, but yeah, a whole bunch of other things too. It, it was this kind of all-inclusive thing. And the whole idea of a mail, mail order catalog was pretty crazy too, right? That you could um, get this shipped to your house, you could read through, order something, and then they'd send it to you, um, let alone the department stores for, for women to go to. This is a little bit later um, in the 1900s, but it also shows you how specifically the advertisements and magazines or the catalogs um, targeted women because it was very clear that women were the ones that were um, that had the purchasing power. They may not be the ones that were going out and, and working and, and earning the money with the middle class because women were supposed to stay home but they had the purchasing power. So you had aids that every woman appreciates. And so it's these kind of new electronics of the 1900s that help with the home. Um, and, and a lot of what was targeted towards this was home goods. Because again, that was their domain. That's where they were purchasing stuff for. And so you end up actually having a whole uh, advertising and catalog targeting towards women. Now this leads us to the cult of domesticity. Let's look at these and then I'll explain. So here's Goody's Lady Book. Um, and I'll write some more on this, but I just want to show you these. This was a magazine. And what was crazy about this is for the time is that it was edited um, by a woman. And a lot of the articles were written by women. Now it, uh, it was um, published by a man because uh, as far as owning the publishing company and stuff but this this was unique in this and the the goodies uh, ladies book definitely um, uh, promoted the cult of domesticity which we will talk about in a minute here um, and so um, I'll write I'm going to continue expand on this in just a minute I want to write some of the key ideas down um, but it, it was it looked at you know, what made a good uh, woman, a true, true womanhood as, as a mother um, and, and what those virtues were. And it definitely was a product of the time reacting to um, the industrialized world and, and how that was changing um, for, for society. And then um, this is with the cult of domesticity. This is talking about um, the role of women within that and, and uh, promoting temperance, which shows the husband here at home reading with the family versus uh, intemperance where they, you have drunken men going into the bar and leaving the wife and child behind. And that's the destruction of family. Well, this is the, the maintenance of, of, of um, maintaining our proper, um, I'll say proper family. This was the proper role of family. And that this was women's job to maintain that. Okay, so we'll, and I'll explain in more detail when we talk about the, the different components of cultural domesticity, but this fit in perfectly with it. This idea of, of that women had a, the pledge, a role to make this happen. And without women doing that, this is what happens instead. Okay, so let's look at the cult of domesticity and then we'll, and we'll talk about uh, Goody's Lady Book and a couple other things um, in there. The, um, has, there we go, let's see here. The cult of domesticity. The cult of domesticity happened because as much as the middle class and the new wealth uh, occurred, um, there was some fundamental changes for women um, because they, um, they were now at home. And it, and it became what was called invisible labor, right? The new, if we go back to status and value in society, okay? The new, the previous value was production, right? That was the old value. And that was through farming 
and and labor and well and women you know their they when it was farming their labor was visible because the husband was home on the farm and he did get to see what the wife was doing and she often was helping out the new value was money right because now people were working outside of the home and getting paid um, and, and so right this is the husband's husband leaves the home to work to work outside of the home and so the idea was that any of the work that she did raising the kids um, managing the household economy buying things cleaning cooking etc that was happening when he wasn't around and so it, even though it seems silly like to suggest it still is something that sometimes happens to this day is that that's an invisible especially for women who stay at home stay at home mothers it's an invisible sense of labor because it isn't being seen done the things just end up done and so it's not recognized or thought about by the husband and so you end up not having that that all that work you're doing recognized uh, as well then on top of that because the new value was money and right women middle in the middle class um, in middle class did not earn money if ideally because they the whole ideal was that they stayed at home and so if they were staying at home they did not earn money so therefore their status went down so in order to combat this this was done intentionally it was promoted through goodies lady book um, it was done in articles it was it was a creation we'll put it this way women created the cult of domesticity intentionally and it was done in order to raise their status right because they recognize the invisible lab labor um, and the dec declining uh, status um, this was done and it was done through like I said we'll put here we'll talk we're still going to talk more about goodies uh, lady book in a minute but it was done through goodies lady book other articles and talked about in women's groups and it was seen as an intentional way to try to elevate their status so what the cult of domesticity I'm going to put the title again just so it's clear here are the characteristics of this um, had was um, that they called it um, uh, a noble profession and the cult of domesticity was also sometimes called true womanhood okay so that will be important noble profession this well if we just break this down for a minute noble right has its own like high of like it's important right it's valued that word has value and importance they picked these words carefully profession why not job right job right that just implies that it's normal labor a profession right is a calling it's something that is more is usually more skilled and usually when people say they're it's their profession it's seen as more of a calling than oh that's just my job i go to kind of thing okay so the first aspects of it that, that was the title the first aspects of it though were uh, motherhood of course raising the children your your job was to raise your children up take care have children and raise your children then that's true womanhood right the next thing was um, the economic center this uh, was that women were responsible for um, maintaining um, the home finances so then this was specifically in this idea that you know uh, protect the um, finances 
even in panics. So that you were responsible for making sure that you manage the economic center of the household, which is difficult to do if there's a panic and your husband loses his job. But that was the expectation of that the women were supposed to manage the economic center of the household. That was that was their responsibility. I mean, this this also is why it led to, right, the purchasing agent, right? They gave all these fancy names to things because then it sounds more uh, official. They were also uh, the moral center. So they were supposed to protect and maintain um, the moral values of the family. Hence why we, the, the picture I showed of going up against alcoholism and how that was destroying the family. Um, and it, this goes with the last one, which was the home as a haven. They were to make the home have be this protective bubble from the dangerous outside world, right? Then with the new changes in industrialization, it was seen as um, that now everything was, industrialization had led to individualism and uh, competition. Right. So now people were only worried about themselves. They would throw someone else, you know, uh, under the under the bus um, to advance. It was that the whole saying of dog eat dog world kind of thing. Um, and so because of this, right, you were supposed to create the home as a safe spot where when the husband came home, those those dangers of the outside world, the, the viciousness of individualism and competition was not present. And so that, that, that whole idea of women then were supposed to go against and protect from those things and also uh, 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 to keep a moral center. Women were the biggest, um, uh, what, proponents or um, promoters of the Second Great Awakening. The Second Great Awakening was a religious revival and um, women, would actually follow around the preachers. These were traveling preachers and they'd go from place to place and women would follow them around and volunteer and, and, and pass out flyers, attend um, the, the sermons. They kind of were actually like groupies. They had their favorite preachers and they'd follow them around. But it, but it, it makes sense because they were supposed to be, uh, help with that moral reform. Moral reform, which is the second great awakening, right? You have a religious revival, which is connected to, to moral reform. If you are supposed to um, uh, have the home as a haven and a moral center, having moral reform would help do that. In fact, why women were the largest uh, proponents of uh, prohibition, ending alcohol, when, until it actually happens later in, in time, was because of that picture, right? If we go back to this, this is, this is that idea of the moral center and home as the haven, right? You are supposed to create this home as a haven. This is the pledge. This is your duty. And this and the outside world, specifically alcohol as the outside world, is corrupting the home. But that is your job to keep a moral center and protect from corruption from outside forces. So you have to do this. So uh, it makes sense that a revival um, and then later pushing for prohibition would be things that women within this middle class cult of domesticity would be interested in um, because it fulfills those aspects. Now, there are other ways. This was all home focus, right? The economic center was about the home and what you were purchasing and making sure that the finances were um, protected in that. The moral center was part of that. The home is the haven, being a mother, right? So it really was super home centered at first, but then what they did is it began to expand out into other areas. Um, so where we see that, I'm sorry, there I zoomed in, um, was uh, with each one of these, and I actually, the, I already did the second great awakening. I showed how it expanded outside of the home with motherhood. Right. One of the things that it happened with that is that, well, what if you don't have kids? This is true womanhood is to have is to be a mother and to be a wife. But what if you what if you don't have kids? Like, then how do you fulfill that? That eventually branched out into social work. 
women began looking at helping the poor. They would go into the poor neighborhoods and provide um, food. They worked with um, prostitutes and tried to um, help prostitution and, and ending prostitution. What's really interesting is that um, the, the women didn't blame the other women for prostitution. Uh, if you look at today, women are more likely uh, villainized as prostitutes than men. In fact, women are arrested far more as prostitutes than the men that solicited them. Um, and, and you have this kind of uh, a villainization of prostitution and prostitutes to this day. But back then, um, with the writings and stuff we have, and it talks about it in your book, women didn't blame, um, the women saw prostitution as a male problem, right? That this was happening because women were forced into it because of the male world, because of whether that was because they had become widowed and they had to provide for their family, or that in others it was examples of how the husband had just abandoned them or was a deadbeat, and so women were forced into prostitution to survive, and also blamed it as a male problem because the men were the ones seeking it out. And of course, remember, women were now virtuous, not super interested in sex, whereas the men were. And so it reinforced that value. And so they went and they tried to help them. Now, if women actively refused help and said they were fine in that position, then they might get the blame. But, but the initial aspect was that this was inherently a male problem and that women should step up and help these women that needed it. But it moved into other social work of, of distributing food and blankets and clothes. This is eventually going to lead to um, the progressive era and settlement houses. So when we get to the progressive era and we talk about the settlement houses which were ran and completely done all by women, um, just know that it had its background in starting because of this. For the economic center, um, where it expanded outside of the home was actually with women authors, right? So this would be um, with books. The romance novel as a genre started during this time period, but it also was articles and like goodies, lady, uh, 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 goodies. It's goddies. Goodies. Um, I always want to say goodies because of good wife. Goody, Rebecca. Uh, a goodies ladies book. I just realized I've been saying goodies the whole time. Sorry. Um, I always do that too because I look at it and my brain just says, that says goodies, not goddies. Um, okay, well, I'm going to talk again. I'm still going to talk more about them in just a minute because I want to look at what they promoted and, and, and what the emphasis, but that's, so one of the things was that, right, you could make money as an author but still be working from home. And that was how you could reinforce protecting the economic center of your home because if you're bringing in money, then you have more control over being able to manage that even if there's a panic, even if there's a significant drop in income from your husband. The moral center, the second great awakening, home as a haven and the moral center also led to eventually looking to be involved in the public sphere of government. Where we saw that, I mentioned with prohibition and other laws that they felt um, needed to be passed to protect the homes. This eventually uh, expanded even to a justification for voting. So um, one of the things is that women had con or will see uh, were constantly denied the right to vote. Um, and again, this doesn't come to the 1920s, but near, near closer to the 1920s, women found that if they connected voting to the domestic sphere, then men uh, were more willing to accept it as a possibility. And so one of the things that women began to do is say, we need the right to vote on women's issues right? Look, we're not interested in the other parts of the male political realm, but they're women's issues like prohibition, like where our job is to protect the, uh, keep the home in this protective sphere. And we can't do that if we can't impact certain laws. 
So we need to be able to vote on women's issues. And when they started connecting it to the domestic sphere this way, more people ended up, ended up supporting women's right to vote. Of course, they're going to find out that then that's not the case. Women voted all over the place. And it wasn't just women's issues, but they used it in a great way to promote that. And some did believe that because of this was that role. So here you see, right, here are the components of cult of domesticity. Noble profession and true motherhood were the titles. The four main components, motherhood, economic center, moral center, and home as a haven initially all focused on those household responsibilities and this was done intentionally to try to raise their status and and move invisible labor to visible labor it eventually though led to those ways outside of the home that i just mentioned um, and it sticks around through the 1950s it kind of goes away during the 1920s for a while with um, the flapper movement and i'm challenging to gender roles but it's still there in the 1950s, and the women in the 1950s just adapt it with the uh, suburban housewife. So, it, and, and, and then it goes away after that. Um, although you could argue that some of these things are still kind of components of, of a mother and wife kind of thing. But, but it really strongly is there. You see it even in the 1950s. So this is a long-lasting thing, and we're going to come back to it. Um, so the last thing I wanted to look at was just how this was promoted. Um, We'll, we'll just do it as a separate thing here with the we're looking at the articles and stuff and the the, the romance novels were one way but you had these um, books and magazines that were promoted it was a book it was more like a magazine that was uh, sent to the house and and the importance with this again was that it was a woman editor and you had women writers Right, and while it was published by a man, like you had women largely in control of of this structure, and it really was uh, an emphasis on um, what they argued that uh, women were the important fabric to the uh, household. Right, they, they, they played an important wor uh, part in the domestic sphere. And it was all uh, centered on this idea of promoting, right, that ideal domestic uh, woman. And so it talked about the different components of the cult of domesticity and actually promoted it, right? They were to be. Uh, provide an emotional and spiritual stability and there were and there were articles all uh, that that constantly talked about how to do that it talked about how to be a good mother motherhood and 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 how to raise your children right it looked at um, the domestic sphere in terms of cleaning and cooking so giving you um, recipes talking about how you can clean the home and it pre preached these virtues of motherhood and domesticity um, and and the importance of of how that created a stability within the home and and made sure that it was secure I mean, it also looked at like, uh, you know, the, it, well, it promoted teaching, women in teaching as an outside job because I was connected to, um, right, the way mothers taught and raised their children um, in, in that process as well. They had lots of pictures and images, all which uh, promoted, um, f like, basically uh, feminism femininity and domestic sphere right so it really did uh, and that's and it's not surprising like the this this was something that was intentionally created and so you had these books and articles and magazines that 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 took upon this and and this this uh, these this ladies books really saw themselves as um, empowering women to to be their true selves that true womanhood right this is the best version of you of what we can obtain what we can do how you can um you know what how you're supposed to live your behavior and structure how to, to manage the household how to raise the children all of that uh to to be the best possible uh woman 
Um, so definitely take a look in the book, right? It has, a, at the end, it gives you a lot of images and stuff and, and gives a good rundown of, of um, all of, really all four of those components of the domestic, of the cult of domesticity. Um, and so you then, you know, even for the women who weren't aware of that this was intentionally created, it gets reinforced in society for the middle class women as the ideal form. Okay, that's where we're ending on that. Um, like I said, but it had significant uh, uh, implications and consequences for women in changing things that we're going to see keep coming up. I mean, especially, like I said, the cult of domesticity was a huge thing that would happen because of the uh, early industrialization. The low mills with early women working and those conditions was incredibly important for showing uh, options and opportunities outside of the household and giving them a connection to friendships and, and, and some uh, uh, control of their own money um, that really wouldn't have been around for them before. And then also, like I said, the importance of when it shifts to immigrant labor, how women then are treated poorly um, and, and have to work incredibly hard because now that they weren't part of that white middle class um, that, uh, and well, and some of them were still white, Irish and German and other things like that, because they weren't the white American middle class, um, they were seen as less than, and it was no longer necessary to protect their virtue. So the whole idea of paternalism and protecting women's virtue was very narrow in its focus of who that entailed. Um, and so, like I said, it was, a, it was a huge impact on society. Not only the changes in technology, the changes in shopping and consumption and advertising um, and what people could purchase, but for women's roles, it had a significant impact on, on, on these changes, um, which again, we'll, we'll see in the progressive era, especially how that shapes that as well. All right, so next time we're gonna be talking about, um, so that was the North. We're gonna be shifting to the South in the next lecture.